I'm excited to have a special guest with us today, Adana Chukwuma. Chukwuma. She <laughs> is the Senior Director, Global Impact Measurement and Visa, but she's also done so many things. Very well-rounded woman. She has been a physician in the past. She advised senior policymakers and ministers. She has a PhD of health system science by Harvard University, two master de degrees and one in being an MBA. The other one is science for global health. So very exciting woman that we have here to share a little bit about her experiences speaking up in her professional environment. So welcome, Adana. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. And I am still doing the MBA. I'm hopefully in, in two years, we can say I have that. But right now, lots of studying ongoing. But yeah, great to be here. No wonder you're so busy. <laughs> you got even that going on right now. Yeah, lots of planning, but it's worth it. I'm learning a lot. I'm meeting great people. And in the end, that's what grad school is about, right? That's what it should be. It is. Expanding your world. It's worth the, the sacrifice. It absolutely is. All right. So you've had some really interesting experiences that not a lot of people have. And still, you had very relatable experiences when it came to feeling overlooked in a meeting, for example. So could you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, it's a good first question. Early on in my career, I think I was a lot more used to coming into the room and having to make the case that, you know, I deserve to be here. But I think the story to share here was when I was blindsided, right? So years into my career at the World Bank, I climbed through the ranks. I now lead teams in multiple countries very complex reforms, have built relationships with very senior people, right, in governments, ministers, in some cases, deputy prime ministers, deputy ministers. And so I lead a delegation, right, to another country. And we come into this room, and the first inkling something is off is I look at where my, my, my name tag is on the ceiling, and it's really far off. And I may be confused about that, but there's no time to, to work that out. I sit down. And the customary in that culture is the heads of each delegation would give a, a, a short speech. And so the head of the this high income country delegation that we had come to visit gives a speech. The head of the government delegation I had supported gives a speech. And then the person on the other side from this country turns to one a man on my team and says, why don't you give a speech? on behalf of the world. And I was so stunned. So usually I'm someone who can speak up for herself. I step up, I respond, but I was just so stunned that this was happening at this point in my career. For one second, I was blank. And in that moment, the head of the other government group that I had supported over many years cuts in and says, no, actually, Dr. Tuma is the, is the head of this delegation and she should speak on behalf of the World Bank. I collected myself, made a couple of remarks, and that moment for me was striking. I think why it was striking for me is I've been in many situations where I felt like I was aware of my power and my ability to shape interactions in the room. And I tried to be intentional about pulling someone in. At that point in my career, I think I hadn't felt powerless in a long time and needed someone else maybe would have benefited. Maybe I could have spoken up for myself, but no, found myself in a situation where I would benefit from someone speaking up for me. But in that moment, seeing someone else, a powerful man, a European man, step up and say, create space for me, I think was remarkable. And I think for me, moving forward, I remember leaving that discussion and also talking with him about wanting to keep doing that for other people. And him telling me, I recognize what was happening. I did that intentionally. And moving forward, that's something I've tried to do. And so, yeah, it was an interesting experience. It's not one that has happened again since then, thankfully, but I think often about maybe perhaps a different way of responding if it does happen again, because you can never know. Yeah, because luckily there was this man who did give you that space. And obviously that's a great learning, right? For us, when we feel on our end, the power, the weight of someone creating space for us in an environment like that, mm -hmm. we learn to appreciate it and, and, and realize how meaningful it is to do that for others and, like you did and i think by virtue of my background there's so many intersections so I'm, I'm a nigerian woman who started leading teams i think the first time i led a team 
like country team in the World Bank, I was maybe in my early 30s. So much younger than everyone at that time. In, in a PhD from Harvard. I have a master's from Oxford. I'm a medical doctor. And it's interesting how to think about what does it look like for me to show up in a space? Because in some spaces I show up and the first thing they see is my gender or my race. But in some spaces, I'm the one who has the more of the influence because people see there my technical expertise, my degrees, and the credibility it gives me. And in the times when I, I'm, I'm, I'm operating in a space, which has happened often, right? I'm there and maybe there's a junior colleague. She's trying to speak up. She said something. Someone has co-opted her idea. And I recognize people respect me here. When I say something, people listen. I have tried to be intentional. I say, X person said this. And that was an excellent remark. And I just wanted to point that out, etc. And so... I think it's something to be intentional about. It is true that when we step into some spaces as women, you're the only woman, it's only men, you're the youngest person. But also think about what are the things you bring to the conversation no one else brings and how does that give you um, influence and power that you can use to support other people. And I like that shift from feeling like a victim to giving you some sort of control that you can, and, and some to look outside of yourself and shift the conversation just a little bit for the people in the room and maybe change how they interact the next time. Yes. And yes, you have phenomenal degrees, right? Yes, you bring things to the table that are value, they're, they're going to add a lot of value to the discussion. But what I observe from you as well, Adana, is that you have a powerful stance, your voice, mm. powerful and not powerful in the loud way. It's powerful because it exudes conviction. It exudes, mm. I believe in what I have to bring to the table. I am here and I'm not shying away. I'm bringing right. it down to the table and everyone's going to notice. Like That's right. how I feel. And it's a wonderful thing because you're commanding people's attention to what you have to say. Because even if you have the most brilliant thing to share right. and you don't have a certain definitiveness to what you say, then why would others believe in what you have to share? So isn't that the truth though? And there's so much in what you just said. First is, I think there, there should be an intentionality sort of inventorying, like in taking an inventory of who we are and what we bring to the conversation and to not overlook some of these things that people try to shape as like soft. Like just the fact that you speak with confidence, that's important. And it brings something to the conversation and it should actually be valued as much as we value degrees and expertise in a subject and who you know, because sometimes that can give you power and all the other. Read the room and think about what are the things that can bring to this conversation that are unique to me and sometimes these things like that. But secondly, I think that I've had a lot of help along the way. I've had coaches, conversations where I'm saying, I'm coming into this and I'm a young woman and I'm thinking about the work I need to do and I need to be effective. And I've been very intentional about my ability to communicate what I'm exuding outside just my words that sort of conveys, I understand what I'm saying. This is what you should do. And this has been very helpful in like high stakes situations, right? So <laughs> when you lead teams, sometimes you need to, you're in conversations where people are looking to you as a leader to sound confident, to sound like despite all the uncertainty and all the moving variables, there is this sense that the person who is, you know, shepherding us has this conviction that this is a place to go. So Maybe not as high stakes as COVID, but there have been situations where it's been important that I wasn't waffling and, and I could. And there are other times when I show up differently, where I'm more asking questions and, and showing curiosity. And I think that's all. It's very important to be agile in that way. As a leader, and it's come with practice. It's come with inventing myself and looking at what gifts I have. And it's come with coach, coaches and support and mentors talking to me about the different ways to navigate different situations. But thank you for validating me. Thank you Bart, for that compliment. I appreciate you. And you're good at receiving compliments. There, Because <laughs> a, a lot of people aren't. Um, and so do you have an example of, of when you've been able to you know, establish a bit of your credibility in the room when maybe you were the youngest, maybe you, people weren't mm -hmm. taking you as seriously? Yes, yes, I, of course I do. Yeah, I work, I've worked in, for many years in spaces where credibility came from experience. And experience is sometimes what you do, sometimes it's how many years, right? So duration, how much time you spend. And you can imagine, you're coming to this conversation. I was hired into the World Bank as a young professional. It's a, it's a wonderful way to get into the World Bank. You come in, thousands of people apply, and over many rounds of interviewing, there's people selected. And there's this sense of, oh, you are wonderful people, you're highly qualified, but you come into the room and you're working with people who have advised governments for 10, 15, 20 years. So regardless of how exceptional you are, 
in a field where there's a lot of weight on experience, there was a question for me of how do I get a seat at the table? How do I become the person where you were sitting in front of the minister and I'm sitting beside the person with 30 years? I can also have a voice. I can also contribute because this is my reason for being. It's my reason that I want to be part of this conversation of shaping systems. And a specific story I'll tell is second year or so, I become the lead in, in this country. It's a really small country. That's a great place, training ground for me to learn. And there's a big reform in the pipeline. And when the discussion started, there was a quick all hands meeting. So this is happening. We need to advise who will go, right? So even the fact that conversation was happening, I'm lead for the country. And so conversation on who will represent us already reflects the fact that there were questions of you not know, unspoken, does she have enough experience? And I recognized what was happening when a much more senior person than me was the main emissary sent to go have the conversation in the country and advise the client. And so he came back. I have conversations with him. What are the main issues that came up? Yeah, this issue, how to raise revenue, how to pay providers, what are these issues? What are the needs of the clients? We had a conversation about that. Then I started thinking intentionally, how can I leverage the resources I have? I'm the one who's controlling the budget. I have all these team members. I have a brain and I went to Harvard. I can learn a lot of this subject matter. I can convene people. What are the things that I can do and what are the roles I can create for the more senior people as well to be part of this conversation? Now, over the next one year, I visited that country maybe four times. I was very intentional about showing up. I spent a lot of time with that minister trying to figure out what his needs were and with his people. I conveyed many discussions in which I think what we did that was intentional is we went beyond the usual suspects in the health ministry. We went to finance, we went to the central bank. And you know, by the end of that year, guess who was leading the conversations on the reform? It was me. It was me and I didn't have to fight for room. All I had to do was think about what is the value I can add to this conversation that is unique. I know I don't have 20 years, I know I don't have gray hair, but I can have really good understanding of the subject matter and all the neighboring countries, technical expertise. I can use my relationships. I know people in the World Health Organization, in IMF, and I can do that. I can think a bit out of the box about solutions that answer his question, new players that can build support for him. And so that's how I create a room for myself. And I think it's something, that sort of technique of just when I come into conversations, taking a step back and asking myself, where does credibility come from in this space, given the players? And given what I have, where does what I have meet what credibility is defined? Because it's different things to different people. That's something I've tried to be intentional at. And it doesn't have to be that when I shine, someone else doesn't. There's room for everyone. And my job as a leader many times is to think about what is that room for everyone to contribute, right? And I built a great relationship with that very senior person who was sent the first time, became like my mentor. And we had a great time together where I was the one leading the conversation, but I knew I could turn to him for advice at some point, but it was clear to the client and to everyone who the team lead was, right? And so, yeah, it was a great growth experience for me early on in my career. And I've used those little tidbits in, and when I've stumbled into situations where I think people are questioning why I, I should be in the room. And I, I try to figure them out, to figure out so where, why is this person questioning? What can I modify? What can I address in terms of those gaps? And I show up anyway. I'm not stepping out of a room because people think I shouldn't if I think I should add value. What I like about what you just said was once you were summarizing how you got there, you said, I made room for myself, right? which is such an empowering thing to say. I made room. It took you a year. Yeah. It took you a lot of intentional moves. Yeah. But you made room for yourself. I did. And that's the way to go. And not only that, you also said that people see credibility different, right? Everybody has a kind of a different way of, right. of what they see as credibility. And you have to work through that. You have to understand what credibility meant for different people so that you could get there right. in their eyes. I could say the things about myself that I cannot change. I cannot change the fact that I am this age, from this country, this place. These are the degrees I studied. I think a lot of times when I've come into conversations and people question if I can do something, I find that in most cases, when I unpack it, that's not what they're trying to shift. It's not about me 
like my race, my gender. No, it's many times I've found out I can uncover something that I have control over. Perhaps this is me and my way of approaching those situations and focusing on what I can move and what I can shift, right? But I find that if I can sit and I can have a conversation, I can listen intentionally, what is being said, what is not being said, what are the needs here? I can uncover something that I have control over to establish my credibility. And this has happened both in my work in the World Bank, in my current work, in my new organization. I can still remember conversations uh, about taking on a PhD during my master's and having those conversations and in the room thinking about how do I convert this person into someone who can write a reference for me? Where does that come from? So this sort of way of thinking, what can I change? What can I move so that this person is always, a, it's, sometimes it's a growth opportunity for me. For example, we talked about me and this country and learning the subject matter, becoming a technical expert. And might I add, years down the line, leading the global course in the World Bank on that subject. That is how much of an expert I became. Sometimes it's a growth opportunity. Sometimes it's just about what do I need to show up? What do I need to present to this person for them to see that you can engage with me, you can trust me. I love that it gives me some control. In a world where we can feel so helpless, I feel like that sort of trying to unpack what does this person need and how can I meet that need? I isolate the things I can control and, and I do something about those things. The other things I can change. Exactly. So why why bother? <laughs> Why bother? Why even bother spending any ounce of energy even worrying? <laughs> it's not worth it. And every time I find myself in that sort of pattern of thinking of ruminating about things I can't control, I turn to my therapist, I turn to my coaches, have quick conversations. You get me out of that mind space because it's not helpful. So do I once in a while obsess over these things that oh, if only once in a while? And I have help for that own up to it and I'll reflect on it and I tr I count on my coaches I count on my mentors to refocus me on being effective on the things that I can control in those discussions yeah you have your set of helpers to keep you on track <laughs> given all of this focus on what you can control on your agency on moving things forward on being intentional about your interactions on all these degrees that you're getting and adding value and getting technical expertise and all of that obviously that's been helping you advance your mm -hmm. career but has that ever not been enough have you ever still struggled to get a promotion that you wanted despite all of that oh yes yeah. So yeah, that's a great question. A story comes to mind that I'm doing all this work and rising through the ranks. I had I'd led a bunch of projects and just felt like I was coming up on the next grade level. Right. And so I have a quick conversation with my manager, echoes the same opinion that I, I, I truly think that you have all the competencies it will take to, to move up the ladder. And so why don't you go and start applying, right? Because the way positions would work is you enter into the competitive pool, you apply for positions, you're shortlisted. I kept applying, I kept being shortlisted, I never got these positions. It kept happening over and over again. And so my usual response to a bad interview is to assess right, myself. Okay, so go to what was I asked? How did I answer it? I had several sessions with colleagues who had achieved that position. And how they come, what would you do differently? Like I was a bit proactive, right? So I was really focused on what can I change, which is my usual stance. But I still remember, I think it was my fourth interview and the same thing happened. And I was just so distraught because it felt to me like I had done everything that I could and I didn't feel like I had control. It didn't feel to me like there were pieces I could move on the chessboard. I'd built relationships with these people. I'd shown up. I had demonstrated on the field, I'd worked on all these incredible projects. I was leading some of the most complex <laughs> countries, politically, technically. And so it was just hard for me to think about it. So I was heartbroken. I will never forget that call. Heartbroken on this discussion with my manager, just in tears. What is happening? And this is where I sell the concept of a sponsor, of your manager, sometimes becoming that person that advocates for you, who just reaffirmed me you you have checked all the boxes the folk the problem is not you this is an opportunity for all of us to think about the process it kicked off a whole discussion among the leads about what's this process for promotion can we make it explicit what the criteria are so it's not a black box can we think about who makes the decision after the shortlist and maybe two months later i got my promotion right i think 
when I look across my career, I, I have had a number of sponsors. Sometimes they didn't really have that label, but people who just gave me that nudge, opened doors for me, created opportunities for me. They've been men, they've been women, they've been black, they've been white. They've always been ahead in their careers and really having political capital and say so with whoever was the decider. And yeah, I, I don't have an answer to how to cultivate sponsors, but I for sure have, have benefited from people doing that for me. And I have done that for others, right? So having experienced it myself, I have in many cases for someone who I thought this person is deserving, they're checking all the right boxes, but they're not getting the opportunities that they should. And I feel like I can support them. I've tried to also do the same thing for them because I recognize the frustration in, in them that I, in, that I had when I was faced with obstacles that I felt were insurmountable, that I, I didn't have lots of control over. Yes. It seems like it worked out like a little magic trick that your sponsor did you don't really know what happened in the back end is that boom just like magic two months later the promotion happened i think one of the clear things that happened out of that process i think enabled promotions for others was just clarity on the criteria was taking this thing that was like a black box and just making it clearer you check the 10 boxes you should move up the ranks and, and i think not just for me, the result of that was good for everyone else. Because even if you were someone who was two years or so away from that conversation, you knew what the expectation was and you could systematically work on those things. And you look at the literature and if we leave these things to black boxes, women fall behind, black women fall behind, right? So making these checklists explicit many times are important for, for people that look like me, right? And so it's not about people moving with, oh, how I feel. Because if you move with how, I, how you feel and all the powerful people are white men, they'll probably pick someone who looks like them. But if we make it, if we make the criteria, has the person led XYZ project? Have they led teams of XYZ size? And then we can check. We can stack both people against that criterion. And because sometimes people want to do the right thing. That's why some bias is implicit, but just when they just go with the flow and go with the gut. So one definitive thing that came out of that, I think, was the clarity on the process and the criteria for the promotion. I think that was important. And I'm eternally grateful <laughs> to my sponsor for really narrowing down to that as a potential sort of way of moving the conversation forward on, on promotions for me and for some others who were being stalled. Yeah, he took what you were experiencing to heart and then used that to challenge the system and how things were being done. But you did your part as well. Not only did, you know, you're exceptional in your work and all of that, but you're also showing to him your effort in trying to get this promotion, showing everything you were doing, to some extent, your discontent around it and in curiosity. I was like, why is this happening? I don't understand what's missing here which then brought him to think about, it really encouraged him to think about what's going on. And I, this is not really fair. Okay, what can I do about it? How can I be her sponsor in this situation? To your point, I guess we have arrived at what one can do to cultivate the sponsor, but in a roundabout way, it is, I think if a person is going to sponsor you, I think they do have to have confidence that you can deliver, right? And a lot of that is the information you're providing on the work that you do, on the capabilities that you've built, on your ability to take on even more in this sort of new role, and to show that you desire, right? So that you actually want it. Because there are people who are, and there is no problem with that. The people who are content with, I want to stay where I am doing this job and retiring in 30 years. And that's okay. But if that's not what you want, I think vocalizing that is important, right? So now what happens in between that and the sponsor deciding I'm going to throw my hat in the ring for this person? That is a black box to me. I know how I make that call. That that was, I'm glad it happened. I think for sure the capability, but also you talking about what you did. And like you said, the, bringing forward the passion, the desire for growth, and even just that energy towards wanting to do things in, in advance. I think that gets people excited. If you're excited, then other people are going to get excited. If you're not excited, it's not going to work. You're probably not. <laughs> that is true. Yeah. Now, you're very vocal about many things. Has that side of you 
ever been criticized or been called or labeled something like aggressive, difficult, abrasive, yeah, or any of those? A dirty A word, aggressive. <laughs> At different points in my career, I have received anonymous evaluations in which people have made statements that imply perhaps Adana should talk a bit less, maybe softer, those are words. She's a bit aggressive, maybe too forward. And I remember the first time I got feedback like that, being very early on in my career and feeling a bit hurt that this was there. But this is my take on that. I remember pouring over this feedback with my coach. And in some cases where I had trusted senior colleagues, going back and trying to understand what is the context in which this assessment was made. Oh, you were in this meeting, that happened. So just understanding because she needs to be softer, she's aggressive. Those are not things that you can operationalize, that you understand. But trying to unpack, okay, so what was the behavior? What was the response? A couple of instances. And then coming back and saying, is this feedback valid? Now that I understand it, do I think this is valid or do I not? And I remember in this back and forth with my coach and trying to understand this because it had come up at that point, I think more than once. So it happened the first time I was hurt. It happened again. And now I wanted to be intentional. I remember arriving at the conclusion that there's something about the way I show up that is authoritative, that is useful in some settings. It's useful for me to come in and be clear about what needs to be done to provide clarity, to provide direction, to be confident in what I know. And being confident and assertive has been important in opening doors for me in many rooms where I was the only person who looked like me, right? One of the things that my coach and I worked out is that now that I'm senior, more senior in my, in my career, there are other ways to show up. You can show up with curiosity. There are meetings where I don't necessarily need to be making the case for something or pushing an agenda. What I can be doing is proving ideas because I'm the one who's the decider at the end. What might it look like to just ask questions? Why do you think that? Why do you think it might or might not work? And to probe those ideas versus being the person, because some of the instances were where people said I was aggressive. I came into the room, I was like, this is what we're going to do. And that's that, right? And just coming in and entertaining different ideas, another way to show up. It's also possible for me to show up as a facilitator. Who is missing? Who is not speaking? How do I pull them in? And so it's like the analogy she gave me is like riding with your right hand, if you're right handed versus your left hand. Now, most times I'm going to show up confident, assured, assertive. That is my default. It's like riding with my right hand. But what I can do is be intentional before I enter into a conversation. What, how do I need to show up? What is the objective of this interaction? If the objective is to move through a difficult decision, there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of clarity, then my, the default Adana, the right hand, needs to show up in that meeting and help everybody just rally the troops and move forward. What we need to do here, especially because I'm lead, is bounce off a, a couple of different ideas and I need to show up with curiosity. I need to speak last and instead entertain different ideas, ask questions and probe. So that's how I've dealt with this feedback. I think that until the end of my career, people will keep saying, some people will just, because I show up a certain way, give me feedback of that nature. But for me, I've tried to focus on how do I become more effective as a leader, right? That is what I've tried to focus on. I will not change my, my core, but I can, in, in different interactions, choose to highlight certain aspects of myself and the way I show up, because that's what the meeting needs. That's what the interaction needs for us all to succeed. So that's my very roundabout answer <laughs> to the A label. To <laughs> the A label. I like how you call it A label, A word. And yes, and yes, Adana, what you said was fantastic. And first of all, I really don't like anonymous feedback for the reason that you just shared. Mm -hmm. Because oh. I would imagine 80% plus of feedback is poorly delivered. Right. And it's up to us to really ask the questions that you asked. Right. To the person who's delivering the feedback to get the, the the quality of the feedback, the quality control up a little bit so that we can actually action and do something with it rather than the judgment that usually feedback is. So that's one little thing I want to share. But also, I love how you focus what you do in terms of effectiveness of your leadership. 
-hmm. and you're adapting your strategies and your communication strategies to be Mm -hmm. effective. And what you said where you show up and your default is to show up confident and assertive. Love that. (laughs) And you also add in the curiosity and the other side Mm -hmm. to it, depending on the situation so that you are effective. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of a study done by this professor at Stanford University, Deborah, Mm -hmm. forgot her last name. For women specifically in leadership, which is about playing high and playing low. Have you heard of it? No, that sounds interesting. Sure. Sure, Yeah, so playing high is playing the authority, playing credibility, being assertive. Playing low is asking questions, being soft, caring. Okay, so these are alternative labels for my assertive versus curious and like facilitation. I like that. Playing high versus playing low. I'll look at I'll look that up. Look it up. And she has some great videos. She has a book on it. And So essentially, she argues that she says for women, because there's these labels that come up a lot, we need to balance the playing high and playing low. In the same conversation, the same meeting, we can do high and low several times, and it balances out that effect that people have around women. Being nimble is is important. And I would say one thing that I learned, have learned and keep reinforcing with, is not to take these things personally. (laughs) People are sending anonymous feedback. They're not brave enough to tell me this is me, (laughs) is really just to not focus at all on who is sending this and just what is actionable here. What can I use? Otherwise, just move on and keep doing. That is what I do. That is, that's what I do. Yeah, you're just moving forward, keeping the eye on the prize. So you are an assertive person. Is that it? Tell me more about that. What does that mean for you? It means many things. And I've had mixed feelings about being this way for most of my life because I grew up in a culture where being a good daughter, being a good girl was you're in a room, you're not saying anything, you're not meeting people's gaze, you're looking down, you're not. And I was always so different. I was always, I would come into a room and all these older men talking and I want to say something. I want to contribute. And I would always have this older auntie or someone say, oh, Adana, that's not how to act. And so I remember being conflicted growing up. Is it okay for me to be me? And I think there was one day when I happened upon it, but I think at some point, I just, I guess I look back and recognize all the advantages that being like this had conferred upon me, all the opportunities to come into conversations and to be listened to, to be heard. It just seemed to me that I know this box against my culture on the ways in which I should show up, but I really like being like this. Right? And I, I don't know when it happened, but I happened upon that realization. And so I think being assertive to me means that I'm confident, that I'm not second guessing myself. It means, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm dimming anyone else's lies. I do think that I can use that confidence, that influence that comes from my voice to create space for other people. It means I don't shrink. I don't shrink that I take up space and that's okay. And I tell you, this might not sound revolutionary to the woman who grew up in the global north, but if you came from where I came from, this is a big deal for a woman to be like, it's okay for me to speak up, to have an opinion, to acknowledge that I have influence and I have power in this situation, to use that power for others. That is not by any stretch simple. (laughs) It is not simple. It's not something I can take for granted at all oh yeah use power acknowledge power not reduce your being and your voice yes you said a few things as being able to be you wanted to be you in that room with a bunch of older um, men and you had things to say why not and that's what it is a sort of this is about being able to express yourself it's being you i like how you put it it's just i wanted to be me That's it. Don't stop me from being me. And I look forward to, if I get the opportunity to raising my daughter, and I think back to all the times I was told to not talk or look down or stay silent. And I'm hoping that I can create a different environment for her. I remember she can just be herself and she can thrive. And she's not told this is the way to be a woman, to be silent. Because I'm looking forward to creating that environment as well for her to also grow and thrive. And how has that being yourself and being assertive and being authentically you in that sense and being able to express yourself fully contributed to your own happiness? Mm, Such an important question. I would almost reframe and say fulfillment, right? So 
I am like a, I'm a very purpose driven person. The twists and turns in my career have all been affected by like deeply personal experiences, an accident that almost paralyzed me that focused me on the need for like health insurance. Working in Northern Nigeria with women who couldn't make decisions about their ch children's health, hospitals that didn't have doctors and saying to myself, this is wrong. They should be doctors. A woman should be able to make a decision, right? And so in, in, all, in those situations and others, it's always been me identifying a problem and saying, how do I use my voice? How do I use my capabilities, my intelligence, my gifts to address this problem? So doing that is incompatible with science, right? It's like, you need to speak up. That's, that's, you need to speak up. You need to be in the right room where conversations are happening about how resources are going to define opportunities for women. And maybe no one is remembering this group I think is important. I need to raise my hand and say, I think we should pay attention to this or that. And so less and about happiness and more about fulfillment and purpose of I have to speak up. It's not about myself. It's about what needs to happen to enable opportunities for everyone and to fill gaps in a conversation that is being had about development, about health, about education, now about financial inclusion. So yeah, speaking up for me is a necessity because not every girl is going to get the opportunity. I grew up in Nigeria, low-income family. Girls around me got pregnant at 16 and didn't go anywhere. So I speak up for them. I speak up for women who might never get this opportunity to speak up, but I want to create opportunities for them, for the girls that they have had so that in the future they can have enter rooms that I've been and maybe other rooms as well. So yeah, there's no other option. It's perhaps what no other option. And when you... Going back to the beginning of our conversation, when you are in a meeting and you are the only woman, maybe the only black woman, the youngest woman, that's when you really need to raise your hand because you're the only person there that can truly represent and more authentically represent that group of people that are not in that room. And you actually had the opportunity to be in the room. And so right. that's even a stronger reason why we need to raise our voices. It's true. And raising your voice is, is, it's speaking, it's applying for that job. It's not, it's saying, it's okay if I don't check every box here. It's important that it, someone who's like me is in that role. <laughs> it's not shrinking, right? It's all those things. and Expanding. I like that word. Just taking up space. <laughs> yes, take up space. And this we is... all do it. That is how the world changes, right? That is how we do a bit better do a bit better on all these things, on health, on education, on fashion, on opportunities for everybody. We shift someone's mindset. It's always rewarding for me, a client maybe I'd started with years ago, and maybe European old man, and the first time I got a seat at the tail end of the table, whatever, and then maybe five years down the line, he's in a crisis, and I'm the first person he calls. And I think about the shift in mindset for this person. Of like The next time he encounters a capable Black woman, she will have a different experience than I had the first time, because by standing up, by, by speaking up, by applying, by stepping up. I'm not just up taking up space for me. I'm opening doors for other people, hopefully. You are and you have a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Any last tips or advice on how to take up more space, how to expand and not diminish and use your voice? Any other last comments? Little one. I think... Ignore the voice in your head and externally saying, this is scary, that you shouldn't do it. Just do it. Just do it. If you want to speak, if you want to apply, want to step up, of course, there'll be doubters. That's fine. Of course, your voice will be something your head will tell you, oh, you won't, you'll blurt out something that, that's okay. Sometimes I, I say something and it's not the most intelligent thing. It doesn't matter. It matters more than I'm in that room and I'm speaking. Because I'm talking about things that are really important. It's really just ignore the naysayers, even the ones inside of you. <laughs> Every time you want to speak up, I suppose that's what I want to leave everyone with. And I keep reminding myself too about. Especially the naysayers inside of us. So just do it. Just do it. Thank you so much, Adana, for for all this energy. Again, I love your energy and your your pursuit of what matters of getting things done, of adding value, of contributing, of representing others who don't have a voice and leveraging that through your voice and uh, expanding all wonderful things. 
Thank you so much for having me. I've had such a blast talking with you. <laughs>